forgiven. And I'll get into the sermon, but we all have a Heavenly Father, don't we? And that Heavenly Father went to the cross and we, He nailed those sins that we have all committed to that cross. And then He was taken down, put in the tomb, and then He rose again. And someday He's coming back for us. That's our Heavenly Father. I want to talk just a few minutes about my earthly father, Donald L. Erickson. Some people call him Donnie. Um, he, he will have passed away two years on the 20th of this month, I think, two years ago. Time flies. Uh, many of you probably knew him. He was running around here. He would be cleaning and tinkering with things all the time. He would sleep here in the pews and said it was so peaceful. He would take a nap in the day and he would do lemonade and stuff at night. And that's, that's a father I never really knew when I was young. Uh, that was a compassionate man, a kind man, a loving man. And he's always been that, but he had a hard time showing that. Uh, he grew up in a very tough household with about 15 kids. Uh, you know, things were thrown at people. People were hit with stuff, all this and that. And so uh, for him and how he handled us, I think, was awesome because he could have carried on that, that horrible chain and tradition. But tonight I want to talk about forgive. And so we're going to start out, I'm just going to walk through the first few words, forgive, forgiving, and the four, the first part of giving. And just kind of break that down as to what the dictionary says about it, because it's important we understand what the dictionary says about forgiving, so we understand there is somewhat of a subtle difference. The word forgive says to give up resentment of. How many of us right now, you don't have to raise your hands, but how many of us right now know that we have some resentment towards somebody? And so it's to forgive is to give that up. Okay, we're going all over the place. There, I like that. That sounds great, Bob. Then there's pardon or absolve. Pardon or absolve, meaning that you release that. That maybe someone owes you something or someone has done something against you. There's an offense and you release that. You let it go. To grant relief from payment of. How many of you wish the banks would forgive our loans, right? Uh, they don't always do that. They don't forgive when we don't pay them either. They seem to get upset about that. Then there's the word forgiving, and that word forgiving is willing or able to forgive. <coughs> forgiving, willing or able. Willing or able. We are willing, but are and are we able? With Jesus Christ, we are able because through the Holy Spirit, we have that love that comes from Christ. We're able to do that. Are we willing? And then allowing room for error or weakness. In other words, you're kind of a forgiving boss. When people make a few mistakes and you don't fight them immediately, you realize that you're allowing room for error or weakness. Isn't it great that Jesus Christ allows some of that? Now, as we go through this, I just want to talk with the, the four also means toward the purpose or goal of something. So to forgive means toward the purpose of giving resentment, uh, giving up resentments and, and relief. Forgiving means to reach or attain the willingness or ability to forgive. To reach or attain the willingness. To reach or attain the willingness. So I share all this with you, and it's, hopefully it's you. You know, kind of making sense, but I share this with you because Friday afternoon was a normal Friday afternoon, and my wife says, why don't we go to the movie? I can only imagine. We did not get to see that. There was a large group that went from CF, and we weren't able to go, and so it was like, great. And, you know, we hear lots of good reports, and so it was, uh, was it cheaper, too? At four? Oh, okay, it wasn't. <laughs> Tuesday nights are, all right? I figured that's why you wanted to go. And so we went, we got our pop, and I got a great big one, and she got a smaller one, and we had a great big pop, and so we went in there, and and it was, uh, it, was, it was half field or so because it was 4 o'clock, but there was already people that we, we knew that were coming later in the night. And so we went to the movie. Now, how many of you did see the movie? Did anyone have any feelings during that movie? Wow. So I went there to be entertained. I mean, I thought it was going to be a good movie, a Christian movie. I appreciate that they're doing that, and they had it there. And so I thought, this is fantastic, so we're going to go enjoy ourselves. And I went in there, and we sat and watched it, and I, I handed Sam, you know, they, they have... Um, what do you call those? Napkins now for the popcorn. It's one big long stream, and so I just kept feeding her a stream to rise. And, she kept... and I was holding back the tears, and I don't know why, but I just was. But I tell you, when I got done, the movie was just finishing, and they were putting up the things telling about, you know, the what took place in the future and stuff. And I said to Sandy, we're going. And the reason we were is because I knew some people that were at the theater, and I didn't want to talk to anybody. I just wanted out of the theater. I wanted to get home as soon as possible. And he's like, I didn't get this. I said, come on, I'll rent you the movie. I got kind of snippy at it. She's like, you don't got to get mad. And I said, we got to get in the car, and i got to get home. And so I drove as fast as I could. No one was driving fast enough on Highway 34. Got home, I dropped her off, I grabbed my computer, I came over here, and I spent about three hours crying and praying and yelling and screaming and all kinds of stuff. Because that movie impacted me to realize I had not forgiven my father. Oh, wow. I had not forgiven my father. I always thought I had. 
I always thought I had, but I came to realize that it didn't. Not only that, I mean, just that movie, how God took that song and started it in that young man and his journal and all the way to where it was and how that's impacted. I mean, and then, you know, the breakup with a girlfriend and then they're back together and it's just like, whoa, it was awesome. But what really rocked me was that, and I know it shook Sandy up and she's like not knowing what to do. How do I help this guy because he's acting crazy? But I was just filled with all these emotions. So I realized, again, that I had unforgiveness for my dad. Ephesians 6.11 says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now I'm going to say that that unforgiveness was a wile of the devil because a wile is a trick or a strategy intended to ensnare or deceive. So when John 10.10 10 tells us that the, the Satan comes but to steal, kill, and destroy, he uses wiles, he uses tricks oftentimes to do that. And I'll kind of share you why I think that was a trick. Now some of you would say, Brian, it was just that you, did not, you didn't forgive us. Don't be pawning it off on anybody. But I do believe that there's a trick that was taking place because as I walked down these aisles and prayed, the Holy Spirit shared with me that it was a trick that was taking place. And he said this. He said, you were comfortable in your feelings towards your dad, weren't you? I'm like, yeah. And he said, but yet you're crying tonight. Why? And I said, because I know I didn't forgive. But he said, you said you were comfortable in your feelings. He said, the while or the trick of the devil sometimes is to get us so comfortable with the dysfunction of our emotions or feelings towards others that it seems normal, it seems calm, it seems peaceful. So all these years I carried this dysfunctional unforgiveness against my dad, and I thought it was just normal. I thought, you know, yeah, I forgave him. Even though if someone would bring up his name and say, well, that Donnie was a great guy, sometimes I'd even say, you don't know the whole story. Shame, shame on me. Should be speaking honor to my dad. But I knew that I didn't. See, the Holy Spirit says, I was giving you hints all along. Because if someone would say, you know, that Donnie, he must have been a great dad or whatever, and I would, I would just in my mind say, oh, you don't know everything. See, dad wasn't perfect. Anyone here perfect? My dad wasn't. I won't go into all the details, but my dad did some things that were very frustrating to me as a young child. And he did some things very frustrating up until about three weeks before he died. Uh, he made some choices that I did not care for at all. It did not fit into what God would have us to do. Uh, but he had been doing these things for years, and he found comfort in them. And I, I have to give grace and mercy. He had been alone for 20-some years, didn't have a lot of company. We didn't go over there a lot to see Dad because of probably some of this unforgiveness. So he found pleasure in going out and visiting with other people that were willing to visit with him. So I can't hold that against him. But I came to realize that some of those things that he did bothered me a lot. And because it bothered me, I was holding an offense against him. Even though it seemed like I wasn't because I had been holding it so long, it seemed normal. And that's what I want to share with all of you. You might be carrying offenses or carrying unforgiveness towards someone, and you think you've forgiven them, but you haven't because it's been so long that it feels so common, the feeling you have towards them, that you don't realize that you haven't forgiven them at all. <coughs> Who loses in that? Not my dad. He didn't lose out. I was losing because I was carrying the unforgiveness. And so I came to realize that as... As the Holy Spirit was kind of pointing out, there were several times when he was letting me know that I had unforgiveness that had not been dealt with, but I just would shove it back to the side. You know what? I didn't want to admit that. I'm wrong. I was wrong. I thought I had that part of me all figured out. It was just fine. Dad had passed away, and we, you know, we said our goodbyes, and I thought everything was fine. But praise the Lord, he kept working on me. And he loves us enough that he doesn't stop when we have an area of our life that needs improving. He continues to try to bring that to the forefront so that you can work on it, cleanse that part of who you are, so you can have more victory with him. Because he's the forgiving God. And so I just encourage you, as I share this story, some of you might be saying, uh, uh, that sounds kind of like me. If it does, I want you to ponder that, and I want you to go into prayer about that, and, and try to find the answer for that. The last thing my, uh, the Holy Spirit kind of showed me on my dad is he said, your dad was a good man with some faults. My dad was a good man with some faults. And then he said, you got faults too, Brian. And so does Sandy, and so does Barry, and so does Caleb, so does everyone here. And he said, who are you to make that judgment? Who are you to think you get to judge your dad? You've got faults too. 
No, when you ponder that, you start to say, well, yeah, we're judge and jury. If someone offends us or if we don't, we're holding something against them and so we're not forgiving them, we've set the stage to say, we have the right to do that. We have the right to feel this way, and so I'm not going to forgive. And Jesus says, who do you think you are? If I forgive you, I give you the power to forgive them. And so as soon as we say no to that, as soon as we decide that we're not going to forgive somebody, we've now exalted ourselves and our desires and our wants higher than what God has for us. That's a dangerous place to be. A very dangerous place to be. And so when he said, Dad was a good man, but he had faults, I, as soon as I said good man, I wanted to jump in and say, yeah, but you know, yeah, he does know the whole story. <laughs> he does know the whole story. But he convicted me strongly when he said, who are you to be judging your dad? And it's like, you know what? It's true. So I began to dismantle some of that unforgiveness. Remember, the definition of forgiveness is willing or able to forgive. I think I was always willing to, and I think I was able to through Christ, but I, again, was so locked into the lie that I had already that I hadn't. I just, I can't stress that point enough, that that trick of the devil to make us feel that what we're feeling is comfortable and fine, you better examine it and make sure it is, because if you've been living that way so long, it seems normal. You maybe know families that live in strong dysfunction in the family, chaos, fighting, yelling, drugs, whatever it all is. To them, it's normal. I shared the story about this gal that was in a very difficult relationship. There were a lot of drugs in there. He had just tried to choke her and kill her, and she was pulled out of the home with her daughter. And, and I had taken her daughter up to the, the hospital up in Grand Forks. We were going up to visit, and I said, what if we could wave the magic wand, and your knight in shining armor would come riding in a horse and take you to a three-bedroom, two-bath house with a white picket fence and a garden in the back and nothing but peace and tranquility the rest of your life. Would you take it? She said, that sounds uncomfortable. See how dysfunctional can become function? And so we begin to think that that's the real reality. <laughs> Satan loves to hide in that stuff. He loves to trick us with that stuff. But as you walk with Christ, and if you allow the Holy Spirit to speak in you, and if you'll draw near enough to Christ, it took three hours for me to get that that night. Uh, Sandy's like, are you coming home anytime soon? Are you alive? What's going on? If you push into Christ, that he can answer some questions or bring some clarity that you never even knew was wrong. So I feel better for it because I've now forgiven my dad of things that, that uh, he didn't do very well. But guess what? I got things that I didn't do very well. And so all of a sudden, it's not me to be the judge. Christ will judge each and every one of us. So let him judge. But he will judge you if you're willing to forgive or not because he demands that we do. He allows room for error. I mean, Romans 12, 2 talks about be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That transformation doesn't always happen just like that. It can. I believe Bob said he was on cocaine and everything else except the Christ, and bam, off. Praise the Lord how quick that was. Some of us have lost swearing immediately, those sort of things. But some of us know that we're working through some things. We're learning to forgive someone that hurt us very harshly. But if you're moving in the right direction, if Christ looks at your heart and says, you know what, you're heading in the right direction, your heart is right, Let's keep moving forward. And he's the God of grace and mercy, not shame and guilt, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago. And he'll allow you to work with him. But see, when that transforming power comes, it comes and the Holy Spirit comes into us, and we've got this whole, this whole fleshly mindset of how we function in the world. I feel in my flesh that I had all the rights in the world to be mad at my dad and still hold offenses against him for some of the things he did to me. But you know, the Spirit comes in and says, no, you don't. You need to release that. You need to have the spirit of love and of joy and peace and kindness and long-suffering and patience. Self-control. You need to have all these things. And if you'll have all these things, and if you'll love like I want you to love, you'll be able to release those things because you realize how much I love you. And that's what it's all about. It's so simple, yet it can get so complicated in our lives, can it? So we'll move on a little bit. But yes, that was something, a revelation that I had, and so I wanted to share that with you. Psalms 51.10 tells to create in me a clean heart of God. Another word, create, working on, building for, creating something, transforming something. So if you accept the Jesus Christ and you're still struggling with some things, realize that you're probably in the transformation phase. And guess how fast it goes? It goes at the speed of you. Because if we hinder Christ in his work, if we hold back the Holy Spirit, if we draw away from him and, and just dabble with him an hour a week, we come to church, that's all we do, is all we do is come here and receive for an hour or so, or, and we say, you know, I just don't feel like I'm moving forward in Christ. 
Well, you got how many other hours coming against you? Yes. We've got to put more hours in to fight the good fight to go forward with Christ than to go backwards. We were just talking with where's Twilight, she said. <coughs> we are talking about the wide gate and narrow gate when she came in. And I said, it's a narrow gate. Come on in. No, I didn't say that. But, but how easy. We walk with Christ and we head towards that narrow gate. We step away from Christ, even if we're coming to church and we step away and kind of put him as the minimal in our life, and you start to veer off towards that wide gate. Remember that sermon I did several years ago? It was called uh, One Degree Off. And it was like if we, if we jump in a plane in Detroit Lakes and we get one degree off in our flight and go around the world, according to, the, according to my calculations, we land in Cuba. <laughs> in other words, we don't want to be off at all with Christ. Amen. And we don't have to be. We have a counselor. We have a guide. We have a Jesus Christ who loves us and wants to move us in the right direction. But if we try to do it on our own power, my friends... We've it's thought about creating a clean heart. We have times to create quite a mess. But we go at the speed of us. Christ will take us faster, but usually it's us that slows it down. So, as we talk about this, we realize that when Jesus died and said it was finished on that cross, it was the process of what had to take place. That final sacrifice, the, the washing with the blood of our sins, the you know, the, the giving up, the, sacri the final sacrifice, the final blood sacrifice on that cross, it began the ability for us to be forgiven of our sins. That enemy of God, we're no longer. That enmity that we have between God, that, that inability to come close to Him, Christ makes that bridge that we can come, come across to God. But it's that blood that does it. And we need to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior to be able to receive that and be able to walk in that. I think most of us here have, because I've done altar calls and not too many come forward, or maybe you're a little bit nervous, but if you've never accepted Jesus Christ, that you've truly said in your mind, Heavenly Father, I've been running my own show and it is horrible. Heavenly Father, I want you to come in and be King of my life, be Lord of my life, guide me, lead me. I cannot do it on my own. I, I receive you and accept you as my Lord and Savior. I'll tell you what, you can receive everything that that cross had. It is finished, that process, but now we live in what took place because it's finished. Because then it begins again, anew. Now we all have hope. Now we all have faith. Now we all have a place that we can move forward to. But we still come to realize that we have to be transformed, that we have to be able to have this new heart to be able to surrender. So then we come back to this idea of forgiveness. Now a lot of us say, well, you know, I'm picking on Twilight again. She was just talking about, somebody was saying to her, you know, well, we just need to be kind. We just need to show love. It's just we need to be kind. No big deal. But it is a big deal. We need to be doing what Christ asks us to do. So when it comes to forgiveness, he's very clear on what he says. So if you're thinking, well, forgiveness just means, you know, Christ forgives me and I, you know, I don't hold anything against someone. I, I can't think of anyone I hate. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. I, I don't hate anyone. But we've got to make sure we forgive everyone. Because he's very clear. On the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, 14 and 15, let me read you this. I was just going to put, I put a sign up today, but I, I found a sign that said, uh, if you'll read the Bible, it'll scare the hell out of you. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, man, that's a good sign, but I thought, well, but some people think, you know, the Bible shouldn't be scary, but if you'll read it and heed it, it will scare the hell out of you, because you'll have, you'll have a, a reverence towards the Lord and not Satan himself. It says this, for if you give men their, forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. So far, so good. They love it. But, there's always a but. People like big buts. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. All of a sudden, where'd that loving father go? Where'd that forgiving father go? Hey, he's grace and mercy all around. He, you know what? He wants to convict you. And if you'll repent, I tell you what, he's right there with you. He can forgive you of our sins. But he says, if you're gonna, not going to mess around, if you're going to hold things against other people, then I've got to hold it against you. We don't like to hear that. Satan doesn't like us to hear that. We come to realize that Christ loves us enough to say, you need to forgive other people. I give you the power to do that. I forgave you for Pete's sakes. Now you go out and forgive them. If you don't, then I will forgive you at the same level you forgave them. Anyone shuddering right now? I'll tell you what, I wrote this sermon after I did my walk, after I did my prayer, after I uh, forgave my dad. 
But it was so impacting to me to realize it, how important it is for Christ to follow his commands. And when he tells us to do something, he means it. He really means it. Not to hurt us, not to harm us, but to help us to move forward. That we can help other people to come to know. It's easy to ask forgiveness from God, but difficult to grant it to others. You ever find that? Oh, we come in church and we want forgiveness. Lord, forgive me of my sins. And then we go out and we don't forgive anybody else. We've talked about the road rage thing, right? You pull out in front of someone pulls out in front of you and you want to yell and scream at them, and then you pull out in front of someone five minutes later and you go, "Give me grace and mercy. It's just a mistake. Hey, what's the big deal, right?" Why do we change our tune when it's the other way? Whenever we ask God to forgive us for sin, we should ask ourselves, "Have I forgiven all the people who have wronged me?" When you start to ask forgiveness from God, just you need to examine yourself and say, "Have I forgiven everyone that I need to?" I want to read Matthew 18, 21 to 35. It's a, a few verses, but we're going to read through it because it's a great story. It's a parable of the unforgiving debtor. I want you to listen to it, and it's very obvious what's taking place, but I want to see if you can find yourself in that situation and realize that sometimes we aren't very kind at forgiving, even though we've been forgiven much. It says, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Now, some of you have got your calculators on your phone out right now, and you're saying, you know, my wife's about three from the total there. <laughs> He's saying forever and always. Forgive, forgive, forgive. <clears throat> Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and that payment be made. In those days, that, that could happen. The servant, therefore, fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. Oh, I love that word, compassion. He was moved with compassion. Are we moved with compassion anymore? Or has the world tainted us so much that we're just hard as rocks? That we just can't help somebody out. We can't just forgive someone some debt that they might owe. We can't forgive them something that they've done against us. We can't just say, you know what, it's just fine. You know, you owe me 20 bucks, but don't worry about it. I'm sure you've got other things that you can use it for. Compassion. Giving. Releasing. But that servant, that same servant, all right, that same one that just got blessed beyond measure, leaves shortly thereafter and went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, which is much, 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 much less. And he laid hands on him, not by Jesus, and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Doesn't that sound familiar? Sounds real familiar. Let's see how it goes. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Who likes to read that? That sounds serious. It sounds very serious. This idea of forgiving. This idea of realizing what Christ did for us on that cross and each and every day when we mess up and we repent and go to him and say, you know what, Lord, I need forgiveness. I need to start again anew. Wash me clean again so I can move forward with you. Man, we ask that forgiveness all the time, don't we? But are we willing to give it? Are we really willing to forgive it? Now, you can say, no, we're not. That's fine. We just read your future. We just read your future. I would get some kind of a, a smoke alarm necklace that you could hang on your neck so when you get real hot, you'll know that you're in the wrong spot because you're not going to be in heaven. <coughs> Jesus Christ is a, is a God of mercy and grace, but he also has some expectations that we will live our lives as Christians. We will live our life as Christ lived his life. We will lay it out. Remember, what's the opposite of love? Not hate. The opposite of love is anything that isn't what Christ says love is. 
a tough, tough lesson. I had to learn it here Friday, so you guys got to learn it too. To realize that he has an expectation about our forgiveness that I think a lot of times we overlook. We hold things, we harbor things. And, and I'm just going to tell you right now, you might have had some horrific things happen to you. I can tell you, I had a few things happen to me when I was young with my dad, but I know there's a bunch of, bunch of worse people sitting here who can tell horror stories about their childhood. And so when I start to say, well, just forgive, just need to forgive, I know it's not that easy. But you can do it through Christ and through His love and through that transforming and through that creating of your new heart. And He can walk you through that so you can release that. Because until you release that, you're in bondage to it. And it happened many, many years ago. Let's try to leave it back there. Don't let that damage continue to control your life today. But it takes help. You might need to talk with some people. You might need to be in prayer. You might need to surround yourself with someone that's a little more familiar in the Bible or whatever that can help lead you and guide you and teach you prayers and all these different things. But everything's possible with God. What gets me, well, here's what gets my goat sometimes, and it's not even, a, this is a side note. When someone says, well, this is just the way I am, I'm never going to change. No one can change. It just can't change. It's who I am. Man, do you limit God? Really, God can do everything, but he comes to you and goes, I just can't make him nice. <laughs> oh, he's too much for me. Yeah. Oh, I don't think so. But he can't change you if you won't allow him to. So I guess you do got more power than God. All the way to hell we go. Powerful, powerful, powerful. You need to realize that we want to surrender to him. If we've accepted what he's done on that cross, if we truly have and we want to live for him, we have to realize that sometimes we have to lay down our desires, we have to lay down even our rights. I have the right to be angry at what happened when I was young. Yes, I understand that, but you have to give up your rights to God and say, now you help me to surrender those things so I don't carry them anymore. Some of us walk through life with 15 Samsonite luggage bags. To every relationship we go to, we never fix the bags. We just drag them to the next relationship and wonder why we have the same problem. Then we grab another bag. Now we got 16 bags going to the next relationship. Man, let, let the Lord take your bag and... We, what was the sign out here a few weeks ago? You've had more baggage lost here than all the airlines combined. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I pray that's true. I pray that's true. Matthew 5, 7 says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And how many of us want mercy? Anyone there mess up yet? Or are you all, am I, just go downstairs and tell myself. Yeah, we struggle. We receive mercy of trusting in Christ's mercy has made us merciful. James 2.13 says, For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Triumphs over unforgiveness too. I had to release it. You might have to release some too. Matthew 7. 16 through 19 talks about the good tree and the good fruit. <clears throat> We'll start with 16. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. So as you begin to examine your lives, do you see fruit? It might be fruit in ministry and those sort of things. There's that kind of fruit, but are you seeing fruit in your ability to love more? To forgive more. To have more compassion towards people. Are you seeing a change in yourself? Guys, if you want to know, ask your wife. She will tell you. And vice versa. Because I hear wives saying, my guy is so much different than he was a year ago. They see it. They live with it. They knew who you were at your worst, and they're seeing who you are at your best with Christ. And praise the Lord for that. And it goes the other way around. Same as your kids. If you can get them involved in church and get them focused on good things that feed them, now, it's interesting, it says, good trees bear good fruit. A lot of people say, well, if I just do good fruits, I'll have a good tree. If I just do good things, somehow I'm going to be saved. That's not the case. It says, a good tree bears good fruit. And a good tree is founded in Jesus Christ. Then we can produce the fruits. So we can't do the fruits of the Spirit unless we have the Holy Spirit in us, and we can only have that if we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And man, if you can have the fruits of the Spirit constantly coming into your life, you say, how to love easier. How to have more joy and more peace. How many of you would go for that? Man. But we have to walk with Christ. 
We have to draw near to him so that he can feed us those things and the nutrients we need to grow that good tree to have more good fruit. One of the greatest things you'll find is that maybe you've had a husband, there's a husband in the household that's been bad, been doing some bad stuff. The whole family suffers for it. And all of a sudden he comes to the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden that whole family dynamics change for the better. And the wife's smiling. The kids are happier. There's peace at home. This guy now feels like he's a strong man with Christ. He feels like he has hope now in a future versus the steal, kill, and destroy of John 10, 10. I'll tell you what, that transforming power of Jesus is awesome. So if you have to surrender forgiveness, if you're sitting here tonight saying, but I can't do it, Brian, I cannot do it, you can do it with Christ. But you've got to turn it over to Him. Give it to Him. Say, Lord, I'm going to pray every day that I can forgive that person. But I'm praying to you to have you give me the power to be able to do that. Because he wants to do that. He wants us all to forgive everyone, so he wants to help us forgive everyone. That's what he's about. He will give you the power and the ability to be able to do that. That he will. I had written down, we show his lordship by doing the will of the Father. Too many times we've said, my God, my God, why have I forsaken you? Sometimes too late. So, as we talk tonight, realize that I'm not hammering on you. I'm trying to help save you like Christ saved me in this area on Friday night. By going to a silly movie, although it was an awesome movie. I just thought I was going to eat popcorn and have pop and enjoy the movie. And Christ came in and saved my life in that area. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I didn't even know I needed it. But I think I was open to it. I, there was a movement in my mind. There was an emotional opening in my mind to receive what he had. I could have said, this is a stupid movie. I, you know, great, great. I'm glad he got back with his dad. That's fantastic. And went, went home and had steaks and went on the way. But I even drove Sandy nuts. I said, I've got to get home. I just got to get home. i got to get home. i got to get to the church. Get out of the car. Get out of the car. I'll slow down. Just roll out. <laughs> it was about that bad, wasn't it? <laughs> because I knew I had to come here because I knew there was something waiting for me here. Christ has things waiting for you if you'll just open up your hearts and minds to receive it. Really. He doesn't come to condemn the world. He comes to save the world. He didn't have his son die on that cross to condemn us all. He had him dying on the cross to save us all. <clears throat> but sometimes in that saving, we have to change who we are. To surrender some parts of us that are broken, that aren't in his word, that aren't following his precepts, that aren't doing what he wants us to do. Matthew 18.35 says, So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you, from his heart, does not forgive his brother his trespasses. That was the last verse in that long section that we read. So we know that we need to do something. Christ has done it and he's willing to do it in our lives. We just need to be willing to surrender it. We just need to be willing to surrender it. So forgiving my dad wasn't about my dad. Friday night wasn't anything about somehow my dad being seen as a better man. It was about me surrendering my thoughts of who I thought my dad was. Me sacrificing. Me surrendering. Me saying I'm wrong. Me feeling convicted. Me repenting to Jesus Christ saying, please change me. Please remove that from my mind. Thank you for opening up my mind to see clearly the wile of the devil, the trick he had on me. Because I thought I had it all figured out. Because I wasn't screaming and yelling about my dad. But boy, you bring up my dad's name and there was a part of me that just went like, you don't know. You talk nice about him, but you don't know. But you know, he was a good man. He was a great man. He uh, worked in lumber yards for years. He always provided for us. We had mini bikes. He, we were in 4 H. He bought us cattle. He bought us pigs. And he let us sell them. He paid all the fee and let us sell them and put the money in our bank account. Uh, a few weeks before he died, he said, I never cheated on your mom. And I believe him. He worked in the lumber yards late, early, you name it. He was a very good man, but he had some faults. You are all good people in God's eyes, but we all have faults. That's why Jesus has so many different things that we need to do and to work on to better who we are. So I'm just going to have you guys bow your heads. If there's anyone that needs to come up for prayer, if you need for, to seek forgiveness for somebody, if you're struggling to forgive your father or your mother or somebody, 
I just, if you want to come up here, I will definitely pray for you. If you want to wait until we're done and come up, I'll gladly pray for you. This can change your life. This can release so much. Satan wants to keep you bound to that, chained to that, that horrible feeling, that loss of hope, that loss of joy and peace. You just turmoiled inside. That's not who Christ calls us to be. So if you need to release some of that, or drop your baggage and tell you, well, we'll have the baggage laying here, and we'll have someone haul it away from the run. Father, please close your eyes. Heavenly Father, if there's anyone here tonight that needs to come forward, wants prayer, Heavenly Father, I pray that you would just encourage them to right now. Heavenly Father, I just ask through the Holy Spirit that you would put all the wiles of the devil, all the whispers in the ear that you can't go up front. They're going to know something's wrong with you. They're going to know there's a problem. Heavenly Father, through the Holy Spirit, I pray that you would just give peace to people that need to come forward to ask for forgiveness, to receive the forgiveness you give us, and then to be able to hand that off to somebody else. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would break the walls of the people that sit here, and if there's anyone in the pews that's not willing to come up, Lord, I ask that you deal with them right where they're at. Lord, we need to forgive. This is just on forgiveness, but there's so many other things that we need to learn about, how you want us to live, and how you lived to help us to be what you want us to be. So, Heavenly Father, I just pray for these guys and gals right here, Lord. Heavenly Father, I just pray that you'd be with them in the mightiest of ways, Lord. I don't know their situations, but you do. Heavenly Father, I just ask that you would just release right now any anguish, any hatred, any anger, any worry, any fear, any questions that limit who they are in you, Lord. I ask, Lord Jesus, that you could help them to forgive who they need to forgive so that they can be free in you and receive all the forgiveness you have for us. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would pour your love into them, your peace into them, all the fruits of the Spirit, Lord. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would just give them a peace to be able to go about their business and surrender these things, Lord. To look to you for the strength to do so, and Lord, rely on, your, on, on your, just the trust, Lord, they have in you that you will honor that. So Heavenly Father, I just pray that you begin to release these things right now. Heavenly Father, just release these things. Bring an awareness. Let them surrender. We break the bondage of Satan right now that is lying and stealing and killing in these situations. Lord, you're about peace. You're about forgiveness. You're about love. You're about joy, self-control, long-suffering. Heavenly Father, pour that into these people right now. Bring your peace into their hearts, Lord. Let them release what they need to release. Lord, we ask all this in the precious, precious name of Jesus. And everybody says, Amen, amen. and Amen. <coughs> been kind of interesting in the last few weeks. It's kind of been a move. Something's taking place. I don't even want to do happy trails tonight. It feels like it would somehow diminish what God's doing here. And so we won't tonight. But I encourage you. I encourage you. If you have areas in your life you need to work on, visit with me. Visit with Barry. Visit with anyone who's comfortable to say, you know what, I just need some help figuring this out. 
My Heavenly Father wants to give you all that He has for you. That abundant life just doesn't mean money. It doesn't mean a nice house. It means having peace. It means understanding that you're walking in His path and His love for you. So we just ask that in the precious name of Jesus. I'll just close in a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. I thank you for everyone that came here tonight. Lord, what a blessing to see so many faces. Heavenly Father, I just ask that you would help them to sense the move that you're doing here, Lord. Sense the desire that you want us to draw nearer to you, to clean up our lives, Lord. The King is coming, and we don't know the day, Lord. But Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd see us in our hearts always striving to get closer to you, closer to you, and surrendering to you. Heavenly Father, help teach us through the Holy Spirit how we can live a better life for you. We want victory, Lord, in our lives. We want victory that comes from you. We ask this all in the precious name of Jesus. And everybody says, Amen. Amen. Before, the gals are going to go down and get ready downstairs. But um, I heard that the gals on Mother's Day are talking about maybe coming up and singing 8 to 10 songs. Or a song. <laughs> so gals, if you're interested in that, uh, talk with Francie or Deb. She's kind of helping line that up. But if you'd like to on Mother's Day come and sing a song, that would be fantastic. With that, we're going to close, and you guys can go downstairs. There's all kinds of goodies. Uh, stick around and you can fellowship for a while. Be glad to have you do that. If anyone needs private prayer, please come on up. I'll yeah. wait up here for you. God bless you guys. Thanks for coming. Next week, we're going to talk about repentance, what it means to be.